All right, hi everyone. Let's um, finish our class on our, our section on Paradise Lost. I think we left in left off in book nine, and uh, I concluded with um, Eve having spoken to Adam. Adam having not been uh, deceived by Eve, or uh, in a, sorry, question. That's okay. Sure. Um, sometimes it's better to have none than some, but it depends on the sources. So I even put one on the website, uh, the Preface to Paradise Lost, which I think is helpful. Uh, I, for first year English, I encourage you just to engage with the source, the primary source, the name of Paradise Lost, because it's a big enough load in first year having to read that text and understand it and engage with it on its own without going to deal with critics and uh, having to not only deal with what they're saying and understand it but to understand sometimes the agendas or the presumption presuppositions they bring to the text I'm not sure that uh, I don't think it's fair to expect you to do that so I don't uh, if you find it helpful, yes, but there's a danger in using only one or two sources, which is that you are swayed by what you are reading and don't know what the other side is, per se. There's often a critical debate, and you're not you're hearing one side of it, and so it's not very helpful, and it can lead your very short essay off track. So that's why I don't encourage it, but I'm not going to forbid it. Um, so maybe you could talk to me about the specific, if you have any in mind, um, by all means we could talk about that, but in general I don't encourage it for the reason, that reason, yeah. In first year it's hard enough to write the essays, engage with the material option, which is very challenging, and, uh, and just try and understand it, and that's what I'm really after. Uh, in upper divisions will most certainly require engagement with the secondary materials, but uh, I don't think that's uh, fair to demand in the first year. Anyway, okay? Okay, and I'll, I'll talk later on about developing a thesis and so forth if we've not yet done that. I've put a document on the website which I'll talk through here a bit. But as I say, I left off with uh, Eve having eaten the forbidden fruit and have, having felt the effects of it uh, which we saw in her beginning by being a worshiper of God, the maker of heaven and earth, and ending having eaten the fruit of worshiping a tree, which is not a great development, and it seems to totally contradict the power that Satan said it would bring, which is to bring her above her station, just as he, who was once a mute serpent and now a speaking rational agent, has been brought up above his station, from animal to um, rational being like a human being, so she expects the same sorts of things of herself that she will become godlike. Um, and when she eats it, then she's uncertain, what do I do with this now? Do I keep it from Adam so that he'll love me more because now I'm a god or a goddess? Or do I, hold on, let me think about this, what if God gives me the death sentence that he said he would, and then Adam gets another Eve? I can't even think of that. That's too terrible. So I'm going to share it with him because I love him so much. You think, well, the reason for it is because you're fearing the death sentence and you're condemning him to the same thing. So in other words, she harbors murderous thoughts. Uh, so immediately we see all the bad fruits of the forbidden fruit in working out in her character so she brings it to Adam and Adam is not in any way deceived or um, fooled by what she says but he resolves to eat it as well he's going to eat of the same fruit and uh, he does so out of love now I think uh, my impression when I first read it and it remains the same that uh, Adam's commitment to Eve is touching um, and very moving. 
but at the same time, we're not to see it only in the light of his, his uh, response to Eve, but also in his implicit response to God. Actually, it might even be implicit, it's explicit, which he's going to share in her disobedience and, and rebel against God. He resolves right away. Yes? Since he explicitly or implicitly disobeys God and dishonors God, in doing that, hasn't he been deceived? Because he doesn't acknowledge that that's what he's doing. Well, uh, the um, narrator says that he is not deceived. Uh, line 990 mm-hmm. and following, um, 995. She gave him of that fair enticing fruit with liberal hand. He scrupled not to eat against his better knowledge, not deceived, but fondly overcome with female charm. So Milton, the uh, commentator, is making it clear what he's thinking. He's not deceived in any way. He's overcome with female charm. Does that mean that he, his brain is switched off? No, it's that he loves her. And uh, there's no deception in that. But we have, we have sympathy with him at least. Right? I, I don't think that we're, um, our, our uh, condemnation of Adam is so harsh that we don't sympathize with his plight. I see. Well, because he finds her attractive and he loves her and so forth. I don't know if that's deception. It's attraction. Well, it's female charm. It's I persuasion think. of sorts, mm-hmm. yes. He's being charmed with sin. Yes. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I said at the outset, here's, here's Milton's problem. He's got several problems in recounting this event. He is recounting unfallen beings and their thought processes, even though Milton and his audience are fallen beings and we don't think the way that they do. or We're corrupted by sin in our thoughts. We're selfish and we don't really prioritize or think the way God thinks. If we did, then we wouldn't be sinners. But we are, so we don't think that way. And But he needs to portray them that way and he needs to make it, pers- it it also compelling or persuasive to his audience that they should do such a thing. Because otherwise it just seems like, how could you do such a thing? When you read the Genesis 3 account, it, it, is, it is challenging insofar as the serpent comes along and says, did God really say, you can't eat of any, you can't eat of the tree? And she said, oh no, just that tree. And they said, oh, it'll be good to eat. And she says, oh, okay, eats it. They, really, that was that simple and straightforward? It's and Adam is with her, and it happens. So it's it's like seven lines. It's not going into any exo- it just It's more narrating that it happened. But we're not given any sense of how it could possibly be persuasive, because it, it seems extraordinary in the Genesis account. And here, Adam's, or Adam, Milton is trying to make it more plausible, I think. Like, how could it be that Eve was tricked by the serpent? How could it be that Adam was also encouraged to sin? So he's amplifying that one or two verses in Genesis 3 in which Eve is spoken to by the serpent, eats of it, and then gives it to Adam, and then he eats it. Because he's with her at that point. Milton tries to make it more dramatically plausible by separating the two. But the question remains, even in the Genesis text, why is Adam just standing there like a tree while, while Eve is being so, spoken to by the serpent and eating the fruit that he knows she should not eat? Why doesn't he say, stop, intervene? Like, which he doesn't, and we don't know. So Milton is trying to uh, get inside the text and present a plausible explanation in a dramatic fashion. Very difficult. So. His explanation is that, uh, so the idea that Eve was deceived, uh, we get that from the New Testament. That Eve was the less um, 
able to defend herself there. So it was not Adam who was deceived, but, but, but Eve. That's, I think it's Peter that says that. If we follow, I think it's Peter. Um, so Milton's taking it from that. It's not that text. That's the explanation there. But okay, well then how about Adam? Because he wasn't deceived. How then did he come to eat the fruit? This is Milton's explanation. He loved his wife. Is love a wrong thing? No, most certainly not. But love uh, has a hierarchy, if you will, and it's defined by the God who is love. And if you contradict your relationship with him, then all the other ones are going to follow it. So the, the, Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is, and he says it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength, and the second is like to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, the neighbor as yourself is here Eve, but he's neglected the first commandment. Right? And you can't have one without the other. And, uh, but her having eaten it puts him in that position, but he chooses it. And uh, so now she, well, the portrait of nature's fall is interesting. Uh, earth trembled from her entrails as again in pangs. Almost like, and, and again, it's really interesting um, extrapolation of the punishment of sin for Eve will be labor pains. It's almost like the earth is laboring now. It's, it's in pain, in agony at the transgression. It's affected not only Adam and Eve, but the whole earth immediately. Uh, it's Paul who talks about the whole creation groaning. They're in expectation of uh, Christ's return. But here, a, nature gave a second groan, sky lowered and muttering thunder, some sad drops wept at completing of the mortal sin original. While Adam took no thought, eating his fill, nor Eve, to iterate her former trespass, feared, pardon me, the more to soothe him with her loved society, that now, as with new wine intoxicated both, they swim in mirth, and fancy that they feel divinity within them breeding wings wherewith to scorn the earth. So interesting, again, portrait here. So the creation is uh, with uh, what, what uh, English scholars will call a pathetic fallacy. So the earth is crying as if the earth were uh, a person. It's crying at the tra immortal transgression, whereas they are, see themselves as leaving the confines of the earth and becoming like heavenly beings. They're imagining themselves as no longer bodily entities, that there's a spiritual ascent that's taken place, or, like, or so they think. They imagine or delude themselves. And then Milton's comment, but that false fruit far other operation first displayed. Carnal desire inflaming. He on Eve began to cast lascivious eyes. She him as wantonly repaid. In lust they burn. Till Adam thus gan to Eve to dalliance move. Eve, now I see thou art exact of taste and elegant of sapience, no small part, since to each meaning savor we apply, and palate call judici judicious. I the praise yield thee, so well this day thou hast purveyed. Much pleasure we have lost, while we abstain from this delightful fruit, nor known till now true relish, tasting. If such pleasure be in things to us forbidden, it might be wished for this one tree had been forbidden ten. But come, so well refreshed, now let us play, as meat is after such delicious fare. For never did thy beauty, since the day I saw thee first and wedded thee, adorned with all perfections, so inflame my sense with ardor to enjoy thee. Fairer now than ever, bounty of this virtuous tree. Uh, he calls it a virtuous tree that it create it it amplifies and there's a little bit of irony here the word virtue uh, has in it uh, the word veer which is a man so virtuous not sure about the etymology of this here but the word veer is a man something that's virtuous is something that enhances your manliness your humanity 
uh, it makes them more now godlike, uh, claims he, while he in fact is being uh, affected in the exact opposite way, he's becoming sinful in all of his thoughts. He looks on his wife as an object. So said he, and forbore not glance or toy of amorous intent, well understood of Eve, whose eye darted contagious fire. Her hand he seized. Now, there's an element of aggression in it now, right? <laughs> Before they took hands, gave hands. Now he seizes her hand into a shady bank, thick overhead with verdant group. Roof embowered, he led her, nothing loath. Flowers were the couch, pansies and violets, and ashpadel and hyacinth, earth's freshest, softest lap. There they took their fill of love and love's disport, took largely of their mutual guilt the seal, the solace of their sin, till dewy sleep oppressed them and wearied with their amorous play. And then, then they wake up. Now when they wake up, now we see the full bloom of the sin. Because now they are, are no longer overcome by their lust and they are uh, sensing what they've lost for the first time. Up to this point, they were as if intoxicated. They've lost uh, their, their passions over, overcome their reason. Now this is interesting. There's a hierarchy in the human person, I should talk about this very briefly, in which the reason rules, rules the will over the passions. This is the correct ordering of the human person. Your reason ought to inform your will to uh, not follow your passions. All these are rightly oriented, of course, but your reason is going to rule your will to uh, how to act in accordance with your body. So that at this point, there's a, a hierarchy within the human faculties and they all act always rationally. Everything they choose is good. But now that original sin has happened and there's been a rebellion against God, remember they sought to be as gods, knowing good and evil, instead of becoming as gods, the rebellion against God leads to a rebellion within their own human frame. So now the passions rebel against the reason and in fact they lead people. They follow their passions. Whereas before they could subdue their passions and do the rational thing, now they can't do that. They have no such control. There's involuntary things. Uh, people, physiologists, will talk about voluntary and involuntary responses. Right? If you're angry, you clench your fist and so forth. You have control over that. But there are some things that you do in an involuntary way. Um, so uh, theologians would speculate that before the fall, Adam and Eve would have total control of their, their physical um, uh, frame so they could they could be sexually aroused when they decided that they were going to be not against their will Not in it. You see what I mean? So there's a rebellion of the physical over the rational even or, And they can be hungry or when they think that it's a right time to be hungry But their hunger is not going to drive them. They're not being driven by their passions now They're being driven by their passions. So the rebellion against God the higher uh, of the of the in the created order is marked by a rebellion within the human body. They don't even have control of themselves anymore. So the rebellion in within the order of being is marked by the rebellion within the human frame, and they can't even control their emotions either. They're all over the place, and we will see the out uh, working of that right now. So soon as the force of that fallacious fruit that with exhilarating vapor bland about their spirits had played and inmost powers made air, that is go astray, was now exhaled and grosser sleep bred of unkindly fumes with conscious dreams encumbered now had left them, up they rose as from unrest. They've never had a restless sleep before, but now they do, why? Because their conscience is pricked. They've done bad things. They know what evil is. They don't feel good about it. Their passions rise up against them and they can't control them. There's 
injustice that's been brought into the universe by their own actions, and they know it within themselves, as it says here. And each the other viewing soon found their eyes now how opened, and their minds how darkened. So their eyes are open, but their minds are darkened. So now they see things that they didn't see before. Well, what did I said, what did they see? They see that the other, their opposite is naked. They could see that before. But they never thought anything ill of it, and now they do. So the, the way he illustrates is their eyes have been open. Well, their eyes were open before. But how do you illustrate that? One thing has changed in the sense it's been broadened, and in, in another sense the mind has been darkened. Well, that's how we do it. Their eyes have been more open, and their minds darkened. Yes? Did Adam and Eve have a conscience um, prior to yes. sinning? Yes. Conscience is simply their knowledge of right and wrong, what's right and wrong. Yeah, so of course they have that. Yeah. Yes? So what knowledge of good and evil did they acquire in eating the fruit? We'll come to that right now. Good question. Innocence that as a veil had shadowed them from knowing ill was gone. Just confidence and native righteousness and honor from about them, naked left to guilty shame. So that's interesting, the way it's put, uh, it's, it, it left naked. The, so the righteousness that covered them like a veil, their innocence, has left them. Remember, their righteousness exists in their right relationship to God. Now that they have rebelled against and they don't have that and they no longer have that righteousness, and not only is that an objective fact, in the way that God will deal, relate to them, but they also are aware of it internally. They now feel their, or sense their guilt. Their conscience has been awakened against them. But it left them to guilty shame. He covered, but his robe uncovered more. So they cover themselves up. What are they thereby revealing? Because they're concealing something. What else are they revealing? that they feel the need to, to conceal something. What does that reveal? Something inside their heads. A thought about themselves, they feel ashamed at their own bodies. Never known before. So rose the day night. Samson, strong. Oh, Herculean Samson. From the harlot lap of Philistine Delilah and waked shorn of his strength. They, that is Adam and Eve, destitute and bare of all their virtue. Silent and in face confounded, long they sat as struck and mute, till Adam, though not less than Eve abashed, at length gave utterance to these words constrained. O oh, Eve, in evil hour thou didst give ear to that false worm, of whomsoever taught to counterfeit man's voice. True in our fall, false in our promised rising. Since our eyes opened, we find indeed, and find we know both good and evil, good lost, and evil got. Bad fruit of knowledge, if this be to know, which leaves us naked thus, of honor void, of innocence, of faith, of purity, our wonted ornaments now soiled and stained, and in our faces evident the signs of foul concupiscence, whence evil store even shame, the last of evils, of the first be sure then. And now finally he asks the question, which he ought to have asked before he ate the fruit, how shall I behold the face henceforth of God or angel? Erst with joy and rapture so oft beheld. How, is it, how can I look upon God now? Those heavenly shapes will dazzle now with it, this earthly, with their blaze insufferably bright. Insufferably bright. Why insufferably bright? They're not, they're not getting any brighter. The, he's not talking about a physical sense of light. He's talking about the holiness connected with the light. He's become a sinner. There's a moral awareness of corruption and a, a lack of righteousness, which a righteousness that allowed him like a veil to look upon God and the angelic beings and to delight in their presence and now he can't even bear to look at it. 
really interesting. So they're naked, and then they clothe, them, clothe themselves. Actually, they don't clothe themselves here, or I think they do. They do it with, uh, uh, they're going to do it in a minute with some uh, leaves or so forth. God will eventually clothe them out of an act of mercy as well with the uh, skins of an animal, which is interesting in itself. Who paid the price for their sin? A sacrifice that clothed them. All of the New Testament uh, notions of Christ and Christ's righteousness and being clothed in Christ's righteousness and Christ's sacrifice uh, as an atonement for human sin, they're all there right in the God's immediate response to um, their sense of shame and guilt and, and covering them and protecting them temporarily. It's a sign of what will come. Remember he said right from the beginning, God the Father, that man, mankind would find grace? So he shows it right there from the outset. But at any rate, um, the, re the response is quite extraordinary. And, um, but it's a, it, most of all, it's a moral darkness. A loss of moral righteousness. Remember God is good. He calls things good. He himself is good. They lose a goodness. They also, there's also an intellectual fall insofar as they don't understand things as well, but the biggest fall is primarily a moral falling. Which means they can no longer look upon God. He's holy and they are sinners. But he says, let's go sow some leaves together and then they go do that. And then... Adam's angry. He said, 1133, Wouldst thou hadst hearkened to my words and stayed with me as I besought thee when that strange desire of wandering, this unhappy morn I know not whence possessed thee. We had then remained still happy, not as now, despoiled of all our good, shame, naked, miserable. Let none henceforth seek needless cause to approve the faith they owe. When earnestly they seek such proof, conclude, they then begin to fail. To whom soon moved with touch of blame, thus Eve, what words have passed thy lips, Adam severe? Imputes thou that to my default or will of wandering as thou callest it, which who knows but might as ill have happened thou being by? or to thyself perhaps. Hadst thou been there, or here, the attempt, thou couldst not have discerned fraud in the serpent, speaking as he spake. No ground of enmity between us known. Why he should mean me ill or seek to harm. Was I to have never parted from thy side? As good have grown there, still a lifeless rib. Being as I am, why didst not thou, the head, command me absolutely not to go? Going into such danger, as thou saidst, too facile then, thou didst not much gainsay. You didn't object strongly enough. Hadst thou been firm and fixed in thy descent, neither had I transgressed, nor thou with me. So it's your fault. She says, he says, it's your fault. She says, it's your fault. You're the head. You told me to go. I said, go ahead. You gave me permission. Don't blame me. Who's the head here? Who's responsible? Who was given the command? And then, and then Adam, in, to whom then first incensed, so the first time he's ever been incensed, he's outraged, Adam replied, is this the love, is this the recompense of mine to thee in grateful Eve expressed, immutable when thou wert lost, not I, who might have lived and enjoyed immortal bliss, yet willingly chose rather death with thee? And am I now upbraided as the cause of thy transgressing? So he gets outraged at this. We'll conclude it with these words. Oh, he concludes it with this. Thus it shall befall him who, to worth in women over trusting, lets her will rule. Restraint she will not brook. And left to herself, if evil thence ensue, she first his weak indulgence will accuse. So in the end, Adam becomes a misogynist in the end female of the species always like this. 
only now. So we start to see the fruits of the forbidden tree and all our woe come out. But they, the concluding lines from Milton are interesting. Thus they in mutual accusation spent. Now who's the accuser? <clears throat> Satan. Now they are the accusers of one another. They're speaking his tongue. They spent the fruitless hours, but neither self-condemning. And of their vain contest appeared no end. So that's the conclusion of Book 9. It's a tragedy. Two heroic figures better than we are being brought to fall. I think it's quite well done. To put it mildly. It is a, an extraordinary account. Uh, in book 10, uh, we see the consequence of this. The argument tells us that the guardian angels forsake paradise and then go up to God and they want um, God to forgive them. You know, say, oops, we were here to guard and we didn't do our job. You know, are we to blame? And then God exonerates them and so forth. Yes? They were being given. They had godly wisdom, yeah, they did. But then how did that not guide them to turn the opposite way and sin again too? I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. This is the problem with the, um, our problem with the account. God created mankind in his, in his image. And at least in, the, in uh, Milton's account, God says that he created him just and right, sufficient to have stood. He could have stood but he was free to fall. And if he hadn't been created him free, then he would have had to, he wouldn't be in God's image because God's free in his actions. So that was a condition of his making. And he would demonstrate that freedom by having the opportunity to choose something other than God. It's crazy to have chosen anything other than God and he would never would have done it on his own but he was deceived to do it, and therefore God says that he will be forgiven because he was deceived. But the deceiver will not because he was not. He chose evil on his own. So Satan and the rebel angels receive no forgiveness, but Adam will because he's been deceived and so on and so forth. Yes, sorry? How can Adam not be deceived? Because he's deceived? Uh, Eve was, but you're right. Oh, I see you're going back to your point. Also, I'm wondering about... Well, but Milton, direct quote, again, not deceived, but fondly overcome by female charm. Mm -hmm. Milton seems to think there's a difference between deceit, which is an uh, intellectual failure to grasp, like a, a failure of logic or a faulty assumption or whatever. Adam plainly sees what's become of Eve. He says that she's fallen. And the arguments were specious, he says. There were no good arguments. There's no good reason to do this. It's insane. And he resolves to do it. That is to eat of the fruit, not because he thinks that it is as Eve advertises. Oh, this is really good. You eat this and you become like a god. No, <laughs> I'm not. No, that's not what's going to happen here. You're committed to death and I'm gonna die with you. That's not, he's not deceived. He knows the consequence, but the, he, he doesn't, what he doesn't know is, and doesn't think about is God. He doesn't think of God in all of that. He just thinks about Eve. So his love for his wife supersedes his love for God. Now, in the, you could see that actually as a, already a species of sin. This is Milton's problem. How can you portray that? Because to, to love something, uh, a lesser good over a greater good is already a symptom of sin. So I think Milton fails there. In fact, some of the church fathers said that the, one of the reasons that Adam fell was uh, um, uxoriousness. Uxor is your spouse. He, he loved his wife more than he loved God. Not many people are accused of loving, <laughs> loving their wife too much, but it's possible.
Yes. Do you think that um, notes can portray uh, sufficiency as in knowledge or does it have to they have free will? Ask again. Do, do you think that um, they were sufficient in their ability not to fall because yes. they had free will or because they had the knowledge of them? If so, why was Eve deceived? It was because of the knowledge. Say they're sufficient. They had sufficient knowledge, and it's not just knowledge of good and evil. They had sufficient knowledge of God and His benefits. They communed with Him daily. They loved Him. They knew that, and they knew that because He was good and loving and gracious, that there would He would never withhold anything good from them. So if He said that don't do this because it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then there is a reason why they ought not to do it, and they know His character. So they have sufficient grounds to do whatever God says, not knowing the consequences other than it will displease God. That they know. Is that why Satan attacks um, God's character instead of... Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Can't, or they can't attack his power because he came before them. He's clearly that. But they can attack his character. So he was before you. You know, he is before us and he says this, but how do we know this? And look, I look at what happened to me. So he's lying, and he's trying to withhold it from you. So it's a it's a character attack, and characteristic of the devil. It's it's exact. It's what we would uh, in philosophy call an ad hominem argument. <laughs> it's an attack on the man. You don't right, you don't attack the argument. You attack the person. It's very effective, by the way. We're about to have an election campaign in Canada. There'll be ad hominems all over the place. They'll attack Trudeau. They'll attack Sheer. They'll attack. They'll. They'll. And because, because people trust people, you want to vote for somebody that you trust. Their policies, you might agree with, you might disagree with. At the end of the day, sometimes the policies are complicated. People vote for people, so you attack their character. It's terrible. They call them attack ads, but they are ad hominems. In uh, in philosophy, it's considered a fallacious form of argumentation and it is rejected. In fact, if you're in a debate, you just simply, if somebody does attack your character, you say that's just an ad hominem. Let's stick to the topic. Hominem from at, at the person. Play the body. If you're playing hockey, you're the other team is better than you, then you, you, you hit them. Right? You can't beat them at the game and you play the body. Sure. True. You can't beat them, you thump them. And you can beat them by thumping them. Why? Because you get them off their game. They stop playing. They don't like getting hit. They want to retaliate. Okay, now they're playing our game. Because we're bigger, stronger, we, we can do the hitting game. They We can't beat them in hockey. Same thing here. Yeah? So that makes sense. Yep. So that attack, I mean, obviously that attack can never be used against God, but. Well, because it's called an ad hominem, so you, yeah. yeah. But Technically, it can't. If you were to have, yeah. But if you were to have a perfect character, would that not reflect truth? Would that not reflect like good um, policies and whatever that you're acting? If, if that character were truly good. I'm not quite sure. I don't understand the like thought. In, if somehow in politics there were a perfect person. Yes. There can't be. No. But, um, if there were someone that had perfect character. Um, the others would still seek to attack the character. Okay. And, but if you had a character flaw, would that not then say that you have a flaw in your... Yeah, no, character, observing character faults is, is legitimate because your character faults are going to result in policy decisions or judgment. Mm -hmm. So there's there's the policies and so forth, but then there's a lot of judgment calls on a variety of things and characters and aspect to it. So I, I don't think character issues are, are uh, that they should avoid character issues, but they don't really do a fair investigation of it. They just say, mm -hmm. they attribute the worst motivations to every action. And the, you'll see them do it. And it happens every election cycle and it gets worse every year as far as I can tell. Um, 
but uh, but theoretically, no, the person's character is an important aspect of, of their uh, everything. Character is the most important aspect of education to this day. It surprises people when I say that, but it is. More important than the knowledge that you gain here about a variety of things, including Milton's Paradise Lost, is the sort of character you're developing, because that's the thing you're going to keep with you. You may not need to teach Paradise Lost the rest of your life. Um, that would be sad in some ways. You may never read it again. That would also be sad. But the character that is developed during your time here, you will carry with you in every situation, and it will uh, influence how you act. Uh, and what sort of person you are, whether you're trustworthy. It's, it's very much an aspect of education, intrinsic to the whole enterprise. So the attack on, on God's character by uh, Satan is obviously slanderous and also false, but there, it appeared to be substantiated by a talking snake eating the fruit. It did this. Have you ever seen this? No. How is that possible? Because of this. And she said to Adam, Adam, how would I know that the serpent had something against me? I, there's no reason why the serpent would have it. Well, it's not the serpent. And there's also no reason why Satan would have anything against her. Because he's got no, he, even he says he's got nothing against her. It's just simply because he can't get at God, so he's going to go after his image bearer. And because he's not a gentleman. He's not going to go after Adam. He's going to go after whatever he thinks is going to work. Very interesting. So in the 10th book, the consequences are there. One of the things that we find out is that God is sent to, the son is sent by the father to judge them for what they did. And then we'll get in Genesis 3, the judgment that's given more or less replicated here. Um, so he will bruise your heel and you will crush his head and the woman will uh, greatly increase in labor pains. And for Adam, he'll toil in the sweat of his brow. Up to this point, he, he worked and his labor was fruitful and it was productive. Now his labor will be marked by pain and difficulty and suffering. So there'll be, it's not a total transformation, this, everything's gone bad. So now you get thistles coming into the, and thorns and the fruit won't always, and there'll be cold that comes in, it ruins the harvest, and things, the bad events will happen that didn't happen before. Those things have now happened. Uh, likewise, sin and death, who are, sit who are sitting at the gates of hell, are now going to enter into the world. How do they get there? Satan paves a highway to hell. That's how. Makes a big, broad, smooth path. You know how Jesus talks about the narrow path and the broad and smooth path, the broad and smooth path to hell. Satan paves it there, and they come across that, and it's not a one-way crossing. Others can come back down with them. And so then they do, because now they've got food. Sin will work her ways, and death will fall on her heels. And then Satan goes down to hell and tells them what of his success, he starts by boasting, they respond with noises of approval that ends up being hissing and they all fall on their bellies. Hissing. So he loses the form and he's stuck there. Um, likewise, God clothes them both out of mercy. He sacrifices an animal and gives that clothing, the clothing of the animal are like the clothes of his righteousness that, that are merciful and prevent their shame from destroying themselves. Because one of the things they think about here is let's think about the further consequences. Okay, it, God said that, we, that death would come, but we're not dead. So what sort of death has happened? Well, it's a spiritual death. We're cut off from God. There's no, we have no access to him. But furthermore, we're going to have children and they will carry this sin with them and they're going to find out in 10 and particularly in 11 and 12 that their first son is going to kill their second and not only that then the whole of human race will be corrupted and do terrible terrible unimaginable things and they in, in a consideration of this think of taking their own lives let's stop that right now because they will curse us 
future generations for what we did. Yes? Um, did Adam and Eve, like, end up going to heaven? Like, their spirits and their souls? Like, did they yes. ask God to, like, did they go actually yes. to heaven? Yes. 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 Not much is said about it in the biblical text. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Like, yeah. What your thoughts were on that? Yeah, I mean, you, we hear that uh, Abel, right? Yeah. By faith, Abel. We don't get by faith, Adam. Yeah. Yeah, it's a sort of oversight. When oversight's not mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe I shouldn't say yes. But they repent. And they place their... So when... Um, so this is a bit of a reading into the text, but I think only a bit, a bit of it. When uh, God tells Eve that the serpent will bruise her heel and he will crush her head. He, he that is her offspring will crush Satan's head, the serpent's head. When she has a boy, she says, behold, the Lord has given me a, a man, the Lord. She thinks that, that that's the redeemer right there. Is that Cain? Cain, yes. Here's the one who's going to crush his head. She knows that she know. In other words, she knows what that means. The rede right. the redeemer that the seed that's going to come. Oh, that's my seed. There he is. The Lord has given me a man. The Lord. This is the Lord. It's him. This is the guy. She's not right. But she is right. It will be some one of her offspring. Because aren't we all offsprings from Adam? No. The all offspring from Adam and Eve will... Like, I mean, like, Jesus, like Jesus is classified as... Abraham's seed. Right, but not everybody that comes from Abraham believes there are two peoples, right? There's the people of God that... that end up, so you take the book of Revelation as the hermeneutic key for reading what happens before in Scripture. There are two cities. There's the heavenly Jerusalem on the one hand, and then we got the Babylon the Great. Two cities, two peoples, one on uh, God, who trust in God, have faith in his son, Jesus, and then those that oppose that, the worldly, carnal, the whore of Babylon. Um, and they are of the devil. Right? So they're that stark division, which is played out eschatologically and apocalyptically in the book of Revelation. But that's really a commentary on the whole of human history. Anyway, um, God foretells in book 10 the uh, victory of uh, his son over sin and death, ultimately. So there's a bit of a, uh, a looking forward. In books 11 and 12, 11's not even in here, and not much of 10. Uh, we are told that... Um, Adam and Eve are given an account of salvation history. So what will happen after them? And this is uh, mirroring what we see in the epic of both Homer, but particularly of Virgil, where uh, Aeneas is told about the generations that will come after him, all the way up to and including Augustus Caesar. So from you will come uh, the Julii, the line of Julius Caesar and his adopted son Augustus Caesar, and he will bring about this great Roman Empire. Uh, the same thing happens with Adam and Eve. You're told, okay, so your first son's going to kill your second son, and then terrible things, and then Noah will come along, and then Abram will come along, and there'll be wars of nations, and then we'll, I'll build my people uh, Israel, but they will go astray, and then ultimately I'll send my son to the Virgin Mary. So he, he tells this whole history, and then even from that, then talks about the history of the church from that day onwards all the way up until his present day. And then divisions in the church. And the whore of Babylon, the, um, uh, the Antichrist, which will be the Pope in, in this. So it's all, it's all the way up until Milton's present day. Yes? So that's not something that even fate, like that they can't control no, they didn't believe in fate. So fate is something that uh, the, the pagan notion of fate, which we see in the pagan epics and the tragedies and so forth, fates are, are divine beings that are above the gods even, the Olympian gods. 
Remember, there are multiple gods. There's the Olympian gods, the gods of the heavens, like Zeus and Juno and Athena. Mm -hmm. And then there's the earthborn gods, who are like Prometheus and so forth. They're, they're, and they war, the titans against the, the sky gods. But above those is the fates that seem to have, uh, they preordain what's going to happen, and, that, and they can't be changed. So Zeus looks up to the fates about what's going to happen. He can't change it. He cannot change the fates. He's totally subject to them. And it's blind. The fates are not dependent on people's actions. They just, it is the way it is. No change can happen. Free will is really not relevant. Your choices are, you, you, have, you might have some choice, but it does not change what's fated. That is never going to change. Whereas in Christian uh, theology, the word fate doesn't occur at all. It's providence and predestination, which God uh, obviously um, not only foresees, but plans for good for those who love him. Romans 8, 36 or something like that. Right, so the fates are not above God, rather pro God's providence is his providence for everything good for those who love him. And that is predestined. God loved us before he, before the world was created, he loved the people that he would create. That's not the same thing as fate at all. Because one is a, a reflection of his grace and his love, and fate is indifferent to the object or the person. So let me go to uh, book 12 and the conclusion of it, which I want to pick up because the archangel Michael has come along uh, with a band of cherubim to throw them out of paradise. Remember, they, it's paradise lost. They're going to be thrown out of Eden because Eden is a place where God and mankind communed together daily, and now they cannot be there anymore because God's presence is there, and they're out. They, they have to leave the paradise. And I will pick it up at line... He'll send his comforter, the Holy Spirit, wolves, apostasy. Okay. Adam's response to this whole providential history that's laid out before him are, the, are these lines. Henceforth I learned, 561, that to obey is best. So that's his choice. You can obey or disobey, but he learns that to obey is best and love with fear the only God, to walk as in his presence, ever to observe his providence, and on him soul depend, merciful over all his works, with good still overcoming evil, and by small accomplishing great things, by things deemed weak, subverting worldly strong. Remember Satan said to be weak is miserable, doing it or suffering? Uh, Adam has the opposite opinion, that weak, through weakness, we will subvert the worldly strong. And by small accomplishing great things, by things deemed weak, subverting worldly strong, and worldly wise, by simply meek. That suffering for truth's sake, not suffering for any old reason, but for truth's sake, is fortitude to the highest victory, and to the faithful, death, the gate of life. Taught this by his example, Christ's example, whom I now acknowledge my Redeemer ever blessed. So the question is, did Adam believe in God well, uh, and have faith in Christ? Is he a follower? Is he with Jesus? Milton's unequivocal that he is. To whom thus also the angel last replied. And these are famous lines. This having learned, thou hast attained the sum of wisdom. Hope no higher, though all the stars thou knewest by name, and all the ethereal powers, all secrets of the deep, all nature's works, or works of God in heaven, air, earth, or sea, and all the riches of this world enjoys, and all the rule, one empire. And then the, these are the lines. Only add deeds to thy knowledge, answerable. 
add faith, add virtue, patience, temperance, add love by name to come called charity. Corinthians 13, right? First Corinthians 13. The soul of all the rest. Then wilt thou not be loath to leave this paradise, but shalt possess a paradise within thee happier far. Now this theme that I talked about right from the beginning, they're going to be thrown out of paradise, the place, the geographical locale that they call Eden or paradise. They're going to be thrown out of that, just as Satan, when he claims to be in hell, that the mind is its own place, can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven, doesn't matter where he is, he brings heaven around with him because he has happy thoughts. We find out that that isn't the case. He can't leave hell. Wherever he goes, hell, he brings hell with him. We find likewise, even in the midst of paradise, he, was, he could not enjoy it and had hellish thoughts. We find that Adam and Eve, having been thrown out of the physical paradise, don't carry hell within them. They carry the paradise within them, even when they leave paradise. Why? Because they trust in Christ. And they can't leave it then because it's always with them. It's within them. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit. God is with them. Right? This is what to have faith means, to be given the Holy Spirit. Right? Because the Holy Spirit is, the, is God's uh, work within us, the person of God, bringing us to embrace Christ as our Savior. And this is the paradise within. So it's not, it's paradise in a metaphorical sense. But note the, the parallelism that's going on. Satan and his claim of that he, just by thinking, can overcome hell. And we find he can't. Whereas they, on the other hand, even when they leave paradise, have a happier paradise within them. So in that sense, the church fathers have called this a Felix Copa. Copa is a sin. Felix is a happy sin. Happy sin. Happy the sin that drives me to Christ. So that the spirit of Christ lives in me. And I am in eternal communion with him. Then uh, Michael says, let us descend now, therefore, from this top of speculation. Speculation from looking down on what's going to happen in history. To speculate is to look on something. Your spectacles. <coughs> For the hour, precise exacts are parting hence, and see the guards by me encamped on yonder hill. Expect their motion at whose front a flaming sword and sick a signal of remove waves fiercely around. So they've got the, fl the cherubim have flaming swords the flaming swords being a sort of a symbolic representation of their holiness. And they, being sinners, cannot exist in the presence of the holiness of God. They might be covered sinners, they're still sinners. And they have to get out. And they've heard of what they will do. And then he goes and tells Eve. And Eve says, I know what you're talking about, and by me the promised seed shall all restore... And these are the famous last words. The angel, in either hand the hastening angel, caught our lingering parents, and to the eastern gate led them direct, and down the cliff as fast to the subjective plane, then disappeared. They, looking back, all the eastern side beheld a paradise, so late their happy seat, waved over by that flaming brand, the gate with dreadful faces thronged and fiery arms. Some natural tears they dropped, but wiped them soon. The world was all before them, where to choose their place of rest and providence their guide. They, hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow, through Eden took their solitary way. Note that providence is with them even when they leave paradise. So God has thrown them out of paradise, but he will lead them and provide for them because he's ever with them. 
God the Creator keeps on creating, and He keeps on providing, and He keeps on being gracious. He never stops it. But this line, the world was all before them, where to choose a... This is the, uh, uh, an echoing of the phrase of uh, the, the Mount Pisgah. When Moses looks on the promised land, he looks out on where, the, where Israel will go. He won't get, be able to go into the promised land. As we know, he'll die there and not enter. That will be for Joshua and company. But this is where they will, the world was all before them, echoed in, uh, if you read Great Expectation, that's the last lines there as well. Directly echoing this. Um, beautiful ending. But they weave their solitary way through Eden, reluctantly, because of all that they've lost. So that sense. Comments or questions? Yes. Last week at this took place. Do you know that they were made at the time that they left Eden? Um, they never had children. Not there. No, not in Eden. No. So it's not nine months. Well, in Milton's account, I'm trying to remember now, I think it's less than 40 days. All the, all the action. That doesn't mean that the time being, but the accounted action is 30 something days. I've forgotten now. I taught it last semester and it's exactly laid out that how many days of action, something like 39 days of action. Or something. But that's not answering your question. How long were they in Eden? I have no idea. But not long. It's not long enough to for even any of the speeches to say that she's pregnant and awaiting a child, or there's no mention of that. that Which is odd then, because um, what's with the menstrual cycle and stuff like that? Does she have a menstrual cycle? I mean, menstrual cycle connected with labor pain, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Does she have such a thing at, before the fall? If if she doesn't, is she? always fertile? Does that not mean if they've had sex that she's all immediately pregnant? Or like what's Because if they don't have, don't they have like complete control over their bodily? Yeah, they do, but they've had, Milton portrays them as having had sex before the fall. Okay. Like, don't they have complete kind of government over their own bodies? Basically, she could decide to... <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Well. No, I don't think so. Why would she want to do that? God, God tells them to be fruitful and multiply, right? Mm -hmm. And to be fruitful and fill the earth, to exercise dominion over it and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there's a good in it. It's something he commands and there's a good in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it can't be long, is my point. Maybe she is pregnant and is unaware of, of the fact. I would have thought that there would be an immediacy to the, she'd get pregnant immediately. But I'm totally speculating. But there's no fallen nature mm -hmm. periods cycles where you're not fertile, that I, I don't know. Yes? Um, do you think that, like, it would have, and this is just like a question, but um, do you think it would have, like, ended like this and God would have kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden if he, like, went for the apple, like, to, went to grab it, but, like, never actually? Missed it? Yeah, or, like, this was like, ah, uh, maybe not. Because, like, technically she already, like, did the action, like, she was going to do it, and then she was like, mm, change your mind, like, what do you think would happen? Nothing. Because, like, the, the tension was there, though, like, that sure. she was going to do it. But, like, well, she was tempted. Like, yeah. But she didn't give it. The temptation comes from the tempter, mm -hmm. and she considers it. Like, it's one of the things, like, when Jesus is tempted, and tempted in every way but without sin, that's what it says in Hebrews. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Does that mean that Jesus really considered it and was, was internally thinking about it and was really wanting to do that, but he heroically resisted it? I don't think so. Because there would be a fallen, that's a fallen human response. This is again Milton's problem with portraying Eve. He has to portray the desires being, the sinful desires being there before the sin's been committed, and that doesn't make any sense. So she's deceived. There's nothing in his portrait, she's genuinely deceived. She's not, yeah. she's, there's no bad character before she commits the sin. It's, she's just totally deceived. And likewise, he portrays 
Adam as being not deceived but overcome by female charm. Again, there's no negativity there. He's thinking about her beauty, about how much he loves her and how much he does not want to her to die. And so I will share this terrible thing. That's not a bad thing per se. He just doesn't really think about other consequences, which you could argue is sinful in some way. If it's a sin of omission. But yeah, I don't know. Anyway, it's all speculation, right? Yes. And they don't even know what that means. And also they don't know what sin is and they don't know what death is. They don't know any of those things. Yeah. These, are, these are totally new things. They just know if God said it, then that's going to be that way. But what is this thing called death? I don't know. The serpent ate it, and he's not dead. Hmm. That's interesting. And then Eve eats it, but she's not dead. So what exactly does this mean? They know it means something. But what it means exactly, they have no idea. Yes? So how does Satan end up in Hillary's last life? Does it end with him just being the serpent, or does it end Yeah, he's, got, he's gone back. To, he's in hell hissing away with the other but the, the, the highway from heaven to hell is now or from heaven to hell from hell to earth has been paved yeah. paved so and he remained a serpent in the well I mean in the account that's he's sort of given the punishment now he's flat on his belly and he's hissing and eating the dust so he's not going to be able to you know go on about what a great victory he's won over God it's interesting because that's in the biblical account too that the sure. serpent like that, but then yeah. it just seems like it just disappears. Right. Satan appears later. Well. And, and does so in the biblical account again. He appears at a few so points what, in the book of Job. and that? <laughs> he's not that important. Uh, in the early church creeds, it says that, you know, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and his Son Jesus Christ our Lord, etc. I believe there's a whole list of things I believe, the Holy Catholic Church. None of those things that I believe in the devil. That's not because they don't believe that the devil exists, but they, they don't want to assert their belief in a being. There exist, they believe in things that are eternal and are matters of the faith, but not things that are spoken of in scripture that are opposed to it. To believe in him is to give him too much airtime almost. They're not saying he doesn't exist. They wreck it. If you look at any of the uh, church fathers, anyone onwards, well, they will talk about the existence of a devil but they're not going to say they believe in him and to some degree scripture doesn't speak that much about him he has got really important role at certain points but not mentioned all over the place mm -hmm. and I think that's healthy actually don't fixate on the devil too much got you on his territory if you do that Yes, and then I will talk about essays. Yes. Um, you mentioned that they had a conscience before the fall. Yeah. And do you know if there's any mention of uh, the idea of a paradise within before the fall? No, I don't. Well, not in the text. So, so they, the, the, par the idea of paradise within versus paradise as you would have it here is paradise is relocated. Once well, it's all. Exists. Yeah, their access to it is only within their, within their within because they're out of that before they, it was within and they were in it we're not told about it because they were always in paradise so you wouldn't talk about the paradise within but they were totally content their reason ruled over their passions um, they only desired good things everything they willed was good everything was good everything was paradise now that they've sinned uh, and everything has been thrown in rebellion and including their loss of relationship with God uh, they can't exist in a place that is uh, represents perfect peace, and so they're in turmoil until they they repent, and then they trust in Christ. At which point they can have the paradise within, if they do that. But otherwise, but they certainly have to. But at that no, it's at that point it emerges. That's how Milton portrays it. I just think it's a really interesting portrait. Not sure where he gets it from. I, it's an, almost uh, looks more of an invention. An imaginative invention. Okay, let me stop here for a second.